the third day and Hugo's second talk. And if you have questions, just stick them in the chat and I can forward them on to Hugo or he'll spot them himself. So without further ado, take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I see the chat. So normally I should be able to answer uh, the questions, at least to see them. I don't know if I will be able to answer them. Okay, so uh, on Monday we had this presentation of the main result and uh, maybe the motivations why uh, one would be interested in this result. Today it's more going to be some type of uh, toolbox uh, lecture where we are going to give you, I mean, I'm going to give you more details on uh, representation of, of uh, the easing model, which is very useful, which is called the random current representation. And this is maybe not the most famous one. So I want to be spending some time to uh, tell you about it. Okay, so maybe first the definition. Of, uh, of the random current representation. So there will be a few terms that I'm gonna use uh, repeatedly. So a current will be nothing but an element of N to the edges of a graph, okay? So you take a graph, a current on this graph is just a set I mean, just a function from the edges into the integers, okay? So maybe here I should be more careful. So zero, one, two, et cetera, okay? Uh, a source would be a, vert a vertex of the graph such that if you want the degree, meaning the sum of the nxy for y neighboring x is odd. Okay, we will interpret that as a degree in a, in a second. Okay, that's the second thing. The set of sources, I will denote it like that. So this is a set of X in V of G such that this thing is odd. And finally, the last thing is the weight of a current will be the following quantity. It will depend on beta, and it will be the product for x neighboring y of beta to the nxy divided by nxy factorial, okay? So this is just a definition. All of these things are definitions. We will see in a second why uh, these are called currents. So just a remark, if you take a, a sourceless current, so if there are no sources, then you can think of N as being the occupation time or the number of uh, times you pass through an edge for a family of unoriented loops. Imagine you, you draw loops on the lattice and you just count the number of times they pass over an edge. You write this as nxy. By the way, the n here, I mean, maybe I should say, so n, I will usually write it like that, nxy for xy an edge. So if you have no sources, you can see that as an occupation time of a loop, a loop soup, a family of loops. If there is, on the other hand, sources, say X and Y, then you can also look at it at the occupation time of a family of unoriented loops plus one path from X to Y. Okay, so typically you are gonna have loops like that, they may be passing, even a loop may be passing 100 times on the same edge, okay? But to get a current, you need an additional path from X to Y. Not necessarily self-avoiding, but from X to Y. Okay, this you can try to convince yourself 
that any current is associated, in fact, to many uh, loop configuration or loop configuration plus a path or loop configuration plus different paths. And that on the other hand, so uh, maybe, sorry, let, let me rephrase. If you take a sourceless current, you can think of it, I mean, it's associated to a, a collection of loops. And on the other hand, if you take a collection of loops, it's associated to one current, sourceless current. Okay, I let you think about that. There are different ways of seeing that. I don't see myself. I don't see that. Okay, okay. Um, why is it? I mean, so it's called currents because you think of X and Y as being a source and sink of a current. So the sources in your in your uh, current N are kind of the sinks and the sources of. Uh, of a current, an AD current. Except it's a very uh, lame current because it's not an oriented one, like it's an unsigned one. I mean, the sink and the sources play completely symmetric rules. So from the point of view of physics, it's not a very interesting current. For us, just think N as being a function from integers into, uh, I mean, from edges into integers. So why is it interesting? It's interesting because you can rewrite the partition function of the Ising model in terms of currents. And I'm even gonna introduce something a little bit more general. Imagine that you take a subset of the edges, A, of the vertices, sorry. And imagine that you write sigma A for the product of X in A of sigma X. This is just a convenient notation. Then I claim that Z of G beta A is equal to two to the number of vertices times the sum over currents with sources exactly A. Uh, sorry, I should tell you what this thing is, sorry. So this is the sum of a sigma of sigma A exponential of minus beta H G of sigma. And this I claim is equal to two to the number of vertices times the sum for currents with sources A of W beta of N. So you can rewrite sums, partition and also partition with a twist of sigma A like that. You can rewrite them in terms of currents, a weighted sum of currents where the the sum is running over currents with a certain source constraint here. So this should be reminiscent, and I will uh, mention, so it's remark. You may have heard about another representation of the Ising model, which is a high temperature expansion. Can boundary condition allow path from X to Y to the boundary? Um, we will not use that in this uh, case, but um, here we are always going to look at random currents uh, corresponding to free boundary condition. But you could assume that you want to work with the Ising model with plus boundary conditions. And in this case, you can think of it as a lowing path to the boundary. But we will, I don't want to be entering into this discussion in this class because we will not need it for the theorem. Okay, so in our uh, setting, you do not allow path to go to the boundary of your graph, okay? I mean, they cannot stop on the boundary. So remark, you may have heard about another representation, which is a high temperature expansion. And the high temperature expansion of the Ising model is getting a very similar form in the sense that you are writing this as two to the number of vertices, uh, cosh beta to the number of edges times the sum, and here it's going to be a little bit different. So it's going to be hyperbolic tangent of beta to the number of edges in a graph eta, where eta also have set of sources A. But here, and this is what I want to highlight, eta is in zero one to the edges. So you also write it as a weighted sum, but if you want, it's a weighted sum on functions from the edges into zero one. 
And the set of sources in this case is again defined by via the same formula in the sense that you want the sum of the eta xy to be odd, or if you prefer, you just want the degree of the graph with vertex set v of g and edge set, the edges for which eta of v e is one. You want this graph to have even degree everywhere, but at the sources where there it's odd. Okay? So it's a, this is a much more classical uh, expansion of the easing uh, partition function. And as a first exercise, I, I recommend to try to see what is the connection between high temperature expansion and random current representation. It's a very good exercise to try to see the, con the link between the two notions. For now, it's not clear, or at least it shouldn't be so clear uh, to you, why uh, the random current representation would be better than the high temperature expansion, but this will become much clearer in a minute. I mean, not in a minute, but in five minutes, okay? Okay, so let's prove this proposition, okay? Uh, oh, no, may, sorry, I just forget. Let me give you another remark, another remark, which is that if I want to look at the spin-spin correlations in the graph G beta, this is by definition Z of G beta A divided by Z of G beta empty set, right? I mean, if you forget about this guy, you get the partition function. And if you want the average of, uh, of sigma a, you want to sum sigma a against the, exponent, the exponential term. So this is exactly equal to that. And therefore, when you write it using the proposition, you end up with a sum for w beta of n on currents with sources a divided by the sum on sourceless current of w beta n. So you can write the spin-spin correlation as a ratio of weighted sums, but not what one important thing is that these sums on currents, they are on completely different currents. On the bottom, it's sourceless current, while on the top, it's current with sources A. So it has nothing, it's not uh, the same type of sums. Okay, that was the second comment, so let's turn to the proof. So the proof is quite simple. It's based on the observation that e to the beta sigma x sigma y, I can write it by Taylor expanding as a sum of a nxy equals zero to infinity of beta to the nxy divided by nxy factorial times sigma x sigma y to the nxy. Okay, it's a Taylor expansion. So now if I pick my z of g beta a, and I write it using uh, this uh, Taylor expansion, the e to the minus h, I mean, beta h uh, g of sigma, this is a product of the edges of e to the beta sigma x sigma y. So I can expand all of these terms using the Taylor expansion, and I end up with a sum of a sigma of sigma a times the product of uh, edges of the so sum for nxy equals zero to infinity of beta nxy over nxy factorial sigma x sigma y to the nxy. Okay, up to now I just expanded. Now this thing I can exchange these two sums here. And I end up with what? I end up with a sum of a current. There are terms that do not depend on sigma, which are these terms. So when I'm gonna exchange the two sums, these terms, I can make them, I can remove them from the sum of a sigma that is yet to come. And what I end up with is exactly W beta of n. Why? Because W beta of n was a product of the beta to the nxy over nxy factorial. 
So I, I end up with that, and then I end up with the sum of a sigma, and what remains, so sigma A definitely depends on sigma, and I end up with a product over the edges, and for every sigma X, well, every sigma X appears n x y times for every edge x y. Uh, sorry, for every edge x y. So here I'm going to end up with the sum of n x y for y neighboring x. That's the power at which I raise sigma x, right? And notice that this guy here. I can also just put plus indicator function that x belongs to A. If x belongs to A, sigma x appears once in sigma A, and if x doesn't belong to A, then x doesn't appear in sigma A, right? They call the definition of sigma A here. Okay. But notice now that the only thing I need to prove to conclude is I would need to prove that this is equal to zero if the source is, is not equal to A, and it's equal to two to the V of G if the source is, is equal to A. That would conclude the proof if I can do that, right? Because I will end up exactly with the formula here. So why is it so? Why is this thing equal to zero if you don't get uh, if the, the source is not uh, A, and why is it two to the number of vertices if it is A? Notice that I'm working at fixed N now, right? Well, it's true because if you think about it, imagine there exists A such that this sum over y neighboring x of nxy plus indicator of a is odd. Imagine there is such a a, such a vertex. Then there is a natural mapping from configuration to configuration, which is to take sigma to sigma a, which is just you reverse the spin at a. Okay? So you stay with the same configuration, but you switch the spin at A. This is an involution, right? If I apply twice, I end up with the identity, so it's an involution. And this involution has the property that if there exists a single A for which the sum of the NXY plus indicator of X belongs to A is odd, if I apply this involution with this A, then the sign of this whole thing is switched by the involution. But because it's an involution, then that means that the whole sum must be equal to zero because the sum is equal to the sum when I, I change from sigma to sigma a when I use involution. But the sum when I use sigma a is exactly minus the sum I started from. So I end up with zero. Okay? So if there exists an A such that I have that, then I get zero. But notice that having an A such that this is odd is exactly saying that this thing is either even, even for some X in A or odd for some X not in A. So it's exactly saying that this A, uh, that the set of sources of N is not A. On the other hand, if the set of sources is A, then this thing is always even, and then that means that this quantity is always one, right? I mean, plus or minus one to an even power is always giving you one, and in this case, you are just summing over all configurations one, and that just means this is the number of configuration, meaning two to the number of vertices. Okay? You go. Yes. Uh, sorry, in this condition, so you write exist A in G such that, sort of where is A, a small A in this? Uh, uh, it's, it's a vertex. It's just a vertex of the graph. If there is a vertex such that this is odd somewhere. Okay, let me, let me rephrase it here. Let me take more. I wanted to finish in one, uh, one page and that was probably a bad idea. So I want the sum over the sigma 
to the product of x of sigma x to this, let's, I mean, I even gave it a name, so let's use it. Okay, I want to compute this thing. So first thing, if delta x of n plus indicator of x, oh, let me write it here. If delta x of n plus indicator of x belongs to A is even for every x, then this sum is just the sum of a sigma of one because whatever sigma x, you always get one. And this is two to the number of vertices because that's the number of configuration. If there exists an A or an X such that this is odd, okay? Then I claim that the sum of a sigma of this product, let me maybe use another later uh, here. Let's put it Y just. Then the sum of a y sigma y delta y of n plus indicator of y belongs to a. This is the same as summing of a sigma x. Oh, I mean, claiming the sum over x and you get this. But this whole thing here is minus the product of a y of sigma y to the delta y of n plus indicator of y belongs to A. Why? Because sigma x is the same as sigma, except at x where you flip the spin. But because it's at an odd power, you end up with uh, minus the quantity, okay? So you end up with minus the sum you started from, which exactly means that the two sums are, uh, that the sum is equal to zero, okay? Yeah. Uh, a should be x, I think. Yeah, okay. I think as it is written, it's uh, so x is the same as a in the previous thing and y is the same as x. And that makes no sense what I just wrote, but I mean, okay, let me, well, okay. You got it. If you didn't get it, try again. That's a good exercise. Okay. So that was just a parenthesis. Let me maybe switch to the next one. Okay, so you have this representation. And um, this, by the way, this computation is pretty classical. If you look at the high temperature expansion, try, uh, so maybe here, try to get the high temperature expansion. So this is an exercise. From the following identity, which is e to the beta sigma x sigma y is equal to cosh beta times one plus hyperbolic tangent of beta to the sigma x sigma y to the n beta x y or something like that. Uh, well, no, sorry. Okay. Start from this, this observation. So instead of doing Taylor, use this writing, okay? And try to do, you are gonna see it's the same proof basically. And it gives you the high temperature expansion. Okay, so this is a good exercise if you never saw this type of uh, expansions. Okay, now one thing which is very, very problematic, or I mean very, very, I don't know, it is problematic for me, is that when you write sigma x, sigma y, for instance, we said it's a sum for, of a current which are with sources x, y, divided by a sum of occurrence with sources empty set. So you don't get the same set of sources at the top and bottom. So it's problematic because you cannot really interpret that as the probability of something happening. It's not necessarily the end of the world because it has a nice interpretation in terms of random works, but for what we are gonna want to do, this is problematic. So we would like to be able to write spin-spin correlations as the probability of something. So we would like the same sum, at the, I mean, summing on the same object at the top and bottom. And maybe the object at the top with an additional constraint. But here we are not doing that. So that's one of the motivation to consider duplicated currents. So 2.2. It's called duplicated currents. 
and I'm, you are going to see the magic of random currents happening. So you, the, the goal of this section is to make you aware that it's very useful to consider pairs of currents. And in order to illustrate that, let me uh, give you a very important lemma, okay? So in order to do that, so pair of currents N1, N2. In order to do that, let me just give you uh, one notation. So note that N1 plus N2 is a current, right? It is a function from the edges into, uh, into the, uh, the integers. And I'm going to define N1 plus N, I mean, I'm going to define uh, N1 plus N2 hat like that. And this is going to be one if, I mean, okay, let me write it below. So N1 plus N2 hat. So this is going to be one for edges with N1 of E plus N2 of E uh, strictly positive, and it's zero otherwise. So this is kind of the trace of the sum of two currents, okay? So I will always call it like that. It's a trace of the sum of two currents. There is a lot of loss of information when you only look at this hat because you are only keeping track of whether the sum of the currents were strictly positive on the edge or whether it was zero, okay? Is it clear? Uh, don't hesitate to ask me now because, I mean, if you miss this notation, for instance, the rest of the talk will not make any sense, and actually the rest of the lectures. Okay, and what is the main lemma that I want to, uh, to prove? It's called the switching lemma. It's a little bit our fundamental lemma, except you don't get a Fields medal for it. And this fundamental lemma is saying the following, if you give yourself a function from the, a, from the currents into uh, say R, okay, then the sum of a pairs of currents, the first current has sources A, the second current has sources B of F of N1 plus N2, W beta of N1, W beta of N2, this is a sum. You, I mean, you may be interested and you will see we will be interested in such sums. This is equal. Well, my goal is to switch the sources. So I want, here I had B, I want to be switching the sources in the sense that I want to be giving the sources entirely to the first current. Okay? Here, delta, is a symmetric difference, okay? So maybe here, just that we are all on the same board, so A symmetric difference with B is A minus B union B minus A. Hmm? So this, well, when you do that, you almost end up with the same sum. So you are almost allowed to switch the sources with no problem, with no constraints, except you need to add an indicator function of an event. And this event is that N1 plus N2 belongs to F of B, where F of B is the event that the clusters, sorry, so this is definition, the clusters of N1 plus N2 hat, intersect B in an even number of times. So each cluster of N1 plus N2, uh, of the trace of N1 plus N2, need to be intersecting an even number of B. Okay? That's our lemma. So I'm going to make a lot of comments on this lemma before proving it, but this is a statement. So just a first remark 
is that if B is just two edges, X and Y, then F of B is just the event that X is connected to Y in N1% two trace. By the way, I'm using this kind of, when I'm saying the clusters of N1% two hat, I'm thinking of the cluster when you look at N1% two hat as a percolation model, right? So here clusters or connections in N1% two hat mean in the graph with vertex set V of G and edge set, the set of uh, the set of X Y such that N1 plus N2 hat of X Y is one. Like in percolation, think of this trace as a percolation model. You have open edges, which are guys for which N1 plus N2 is strictly positive. And you have closed edges, which are guys for which it's zero. And in this percolation model, you look at the connected components, the clusters, and you want that every cluster intersect an even number of Bs. You are not allowed to have, for instance, a single vertex B in one of the clusters. Okay? Is it clear at this stage? Or is everybody completely lost? Okay, so FB is the event that all the clusters in my percolation model, all the clusters in my percolation model, they intersect an even number of, uh, of vertices in B. Let me maybe draw a picture. So let's say this is my percolation. So this is a graph I just drew the N1 plus N2 of E equal one or equivalently the N1 plus N2 of E strictly positive, okay? And the event FB occurs if each cluster intersects an even number of elements in B. Let's say this is B. So this, is an, this would be a configuration where you, um, you have the event FB. If B would have, say, a vertex here, this connected component here would contain only one guy in B, so it will not be in the event FB, okay? Um, if, same thing, you would have three guys here, you will get again a problem because this cluster will intersect only an odd number of guys, okay? So notice that in particular, when you take uh, B, which is X and Y, then all the, all the clusters are gonna intersect zero people in B, except one cluster that will be intersecting both X and Y. So if X and Y are in the same cluster, that does mean that X is connected to Y. Okay? How you go in what sense is hat a trace? Uh, trace in the sense of the trace of a random walk. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That's a very good thing. Um, uh, not that I know of, uh, Tal. At least I don't. Uh, and, um, yeah, I explained a little bit more. Okay, good. Okay, um, I'm going to prove this uh, fundamental lemma at some point, but maybe for now it looks a little bit abstract. So I would like to be starting with applications of this uh, switching lemma. Okay, just to give you how powerful this lemma is. Okay, so I start with the application. And in order to state, let me maybe erase this thing. In order to state the applications, I'm gonna introduce a, a measure. So let's call P A G beta, okay? This is the, the probability measure 
own uh, the set of n such that the set of sources is a so this here is why i have this superscript a giving probability proportional to w beta of n to each n okay so another way of saying is that p a g beta of n is just w beta of n divided by z if the sources is a and it's zero otherwise okay that's just a notation okay so it's a probability measure and second thing i'm going to write p a1 a k g beta just for p a1 g beta product measure with p a k g beta okay so under this measure here uh, under this measure n1 and nk are independent and n i is has a low p a i g beta okay it's just a notation for now but you are going to see it's a cool notation because for instance first application if i look at sigma a or let me even write sigma x sigma y g beta and i look at it squared well, I claim that this is a probability for this measure that x is connected to y in n1 plus n2 hat. So for, we didn't manage to write the spin-spin correlation as um, a probability, but we did manage to write the square of it as a probability. So proof. Let's look at sigma x, sigma y squared g beta. This is z g beta x y squared divided by g, uh, z of g beta empty set squared, right? This is uh, the definition. But this, if I rewrite it, in terms of sums, so it's a sum of n1 equal xy, n2 equal xy, w beta of n1, w beta of n2, divided by the sum for sourceless currents of w beta of n1, w beta of n2. Did I lose people on this step? It's just using the main proposition, it's using this proposition. Right, I can write the Z in terms of sourceless currents, uh, in terms of currents with certain source constraints. But now here, I'm allowed to switch the sources like that, right? The only thing I need to add when I do that is I need to add the indicator function that x is connected to y in n1 plus n2 hat. But when I'm looking at xy, symmetric difference with xy here. Well, this is just the empty set. So I'm summing at the top and bottom now on currents with no sources in both cases. It's just that at the top, I have this indicator function that X is connected to Y in N1% to hat. But now when I look at the definition of this measure, and I see that here I have a product of two weights, I just notice that this is exactly P empty set, empty set G beta of X connected to Y in N1% to hat. Okay, so the switching lemma made you use the fact that you are going to remove the sources by doing the symmetric difference between xy and xy itself. 
Okay. Just a second application to see whether uh, you got it. If I look at sigma a g beta squared, what will be the writing of this guy? So if I go back here, I can play the same game, except here, I'm not gonna, gonna have x, y, I'm gonna have a everywhere. So the only difference is that here, I'm not gonna get x connected to y, I'm gonna get n1 percent two hat belongs to fa. So the only difference, I'm gonna remove that because like that it will be clearer in the uh, ending, uh, I mean, when I will uh, put on the web page the slides. So here, you end up with n1 percent two hat belongs to fa. Okay. By the way, this is a way to, I mean, well, yeah, okay, sorry. One level higher, a slightly more difficult thing, but not much. How do you write sigma a, sigma b, g beta? Well, I claim that this is equal to sigma a, g, b, uh, so, uh, what, what am I doing? No, sorry, that's the opposite. <laughs> course. So how do you write sigma a g beta, sigma b g beta, sorry. So I claim that this is equal to sigma a sigma b times the probability this time there will be sources of n1 percent 2 belongs to f a, the f b. Sorry. I claim this. Notice that this has one trivial consequence. So uh, let, let me maybe prove it first. So let's try to prove this. Okay, we restart as usual. We take this thing. So this is Z of G beta A, Z of G beta B, divided by Z G beta empty set squared. You agree with me? Now this, if I rewrite in terms of currents, this is this thing divided by the sum of a sourceless current. Maybe I'm gonna put a little bit more room just to, to avoid having something as crowded as before. Okay, like that. Here it's just the standard rewriting. But now I can switch the sources by adding indicator that n1 plus n2 hat belongs to fb. And now when I'm here, notice that this ratio is not quite a probability measure, but this I can also rewrite it as a sum n1 equal a, or let me be a little bit more. The sum n1 equal a symmetric difference b, n2 equal empty set of w beta n1, w beta n2 indicator than n1 percent two hat belongs to fb. I can divide by the same sums but without, maybe I'm gonna write it fully because that's the first time, but not the last time we see something like that. So I can divide by this and multiply by the same term here and keep the divided by the sum of a sourceless current. When I did that, what do I end up with? This thing here, what is it? If I'm summing this and divided by this, this is just sigma a sigma b g beta, right? Because if you want it sigma, maybe I should write it like that. It's sigma a symmetric difference with b 
G beta, but this is just sigma A, sigma B, G beta, right? So the second term gives me this term. The first term now, where well, the first term, now we have the same set of sources at the top and bottom, so it's really now exactly equal to the probability asymmetric difference with B empty set G beta of N1 plus N2 hat belongs to FB. Okay? So you see, once you have the switching lemma, things are going fairly smoothly. I took time to write these things just for you to, to have at least one example of a full derivation. Remark, and this is really, I think, the cute thing, is that that tells you that sigma A sigma B is smaller or equal to sigma A sigma B, right? Because this is a probability measure. So it has to be smaller or equal to one. And this inequality that I just wrote, this is the second Griffiths inequality. It's a very famous inequality for the easing model. So you just got a fairly elementary uh, derivation of Griffith inequality. Of course, subject to the switching lemma, maybe you, you will not like the proof of the switching lemma, but this is a fairly elementary proof. And notice that it also gives you the defect. It tells you how much smaller you are. It's exactly encoded in this even N1 percent two hats belongs to FB. Okay? Um, just another comment, and then I, we make a break, is that this, by the way, has a trivial consequence, which is that d over d beta of sigma a, which is sum over x neighboring one of sigma a, sigma x, sigma y, minus sigma a, sigma x, sigma y. This is positive. So it tells you that correlations increase with beta. So in particular, the existence of beta C in the first class follows from the second Griffiths inequality, which itself follows very easily from the switching lemma. Okay? So that tells you a little bit how powerful these things are. You are going to see we are not done yet. I'm going to give you other applications of the switching lemma, and then we will prove the switching lemma. Okay, so let's make a break. And... Um, I mean, is it a good time to make a break? I think so. So maybe we make a break for 10 minutes. Okay, good. We okay. resume at 12. Um, yes, so, I'm, so you said that the existence of beta critical follows from this, but, so, but non there's also non-triviality of this beta critical? No, no, no. This doesn't follow from it. Yes, you're right. What I meant is that the beta C as the infimum of the, so I mean, it, it gives you that beta C, which you could define as the infimum of the beta, such that M of beta is positive, for instance, is also the supremum of the beta, such that M of beta is zero. You can derive this easily from, uh, okay. from, from Griffith's okay. inequality. Yeah, you are right that whether beta C is strictly smaller than infinity, or not, that is not uh, straightforward out of this. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hugo, there's yeah. one thing that I don't quite understand. So, so the equation three seems to be symmetric in A and B, right? Apart yeah. from probability. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So does it mean that the probability of this A symmetric difference B that N1 plus N2 hat belongs to have B is the same as N1? Exactly. That's a very good point. And it's something that you can check. So you see, because you have sources A symmetric difference with B, you can check that if the event FB occurs, actually necessarily the event FA occurs. So it's not even that the probability are equal, it's that it's true point-wise. These are the same events. It's the same events under the measure, I mean, oh, okay. They are the same events for when you restrict them to uh, currents with sources asymmetric difference with B. Yeah. That's a very good comment. 
Okay. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then we can pick it up in 10 minutes. Very good. Thanks. So, so I will answer uh, Trish's question because it's an interesting one indeed. Uh, and there is no good reason why I wrote it like that. I mean, uh, so N1 percent, two, the, fi the fact that the trace is in the event FB, as I wrote, is in fact equivalent to there exists N small or equal to N1 percent 2, such that the set of sources is B. And in fact, it's exactly what we are going to use in the proof, so it's not better. I mean, I, probably this is a better notation. This, is, this will be a better way of, of writing the condition. It's just that I, I, I indeed let you think about it. It's an interesting exercise to see that it is equivalent. In fact. These are the same conditions. But you are entirely right. I mean, there is no good reason to be, uh, it's kind of bad habits because at the beginning I was using this FB notation because that's also the notation you use for the random cluster model. So that kind of gave some connection. But as it is, I mean, it doesn't, it's not better. So let's even, uh, I mean, people can think of this second one. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this uh, second part, I'm first going to prove to use the lemma because I want that you have a full proof of that. And then depending on how much time I have left, I will give you a few or more applications of, uh, of the switching lemma to try to really illustrate how powerful this is. Okay, so proof of the switching lemma. This was a remark. Okay, so in order for, to, to prove the switching lemma, we are gonna use the correspondence between currents and multigraph. So a current N, or let's say M will be mapped to a multigraph M. So a multigraph M will have vertex set V of G and we'll have M X Y edges between X and Y. Okay, so imagine that, I don't know, you are on this graph and that uh, here the current is one, 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 two, zero, zero. Then the multigraph associated to it would be one edge like that, two like that, one, one, and no edges between the two. Okay? Is the definition of M clear? Okay. So the proof of the lemma is actually just going to be a change of variables. It's not very difficult. So we are going to write M equal uh, and by the way, then we also write this as this, okay? And, by, and, and it is exactly the set of vertices with an odd degree in M, right? Okay, so we make the change of variable M equal N1 percent two and N equal N2, okay? And we now go with our sum for N1 equal A, N2 equal B of F of n1 percent 2, wn1, wn2, let me drop the, the beta uh, from the notation. And this, first I claim that this is equal to the sum where I sum on m and n. And I claim that this is equal to f of m, w of m, and then the sum Oh, uh, let me write it like that. The product, this, I mean, the sum of a N without source, uh, with sources B, sorry, of NXY, MXY. Okay, so that's maybe the first step of the proof and I want to be clear on this step. So here, this thing becomes this right in the change of variable. Now, this thing, oh, let me use another letter. This thing, let me write it here. W N1, W N2 is a product of edges of beta to the N1 XY plus N2 XY 
divided by n1 xy factorial n2, uh, sorry, I forgot the product here. That's not good, sorry. Product, uh, product of the edges of n x y n x y sorry so let me go back here so n2 x y factorial and now here if i multiply by n1 plus n2 x y factorial and divide by n1 plus n2 x y factorial i end up here this is m x y here it is m x y factorial so this whole thing is just W of M, but I end up with a product of a XY of MXY divided by N1 XY factorial N2 XY factorial. So the orange is giving me this and the yellow is giving me this, okay? But now the trick, and it's a cute trick, is that this product of a X, I mean this sum for sourceless, I mean for current resources B of the product of a X neighboring Y of NXY choose MXY. This is exactly the number of ways of choosing N included in M such that N is B. Why? Because if you fix NXY, this product of NXY choose MXY is exactly the number of ways of choosing a subgraph of M which have exactly NXY edges on every edge. So if you resum on N, you exactly end up with this quantity. Okay? So overall, this sum, let's call it one. So overall one is equal to the sum for currents M with sources A symmetric difference B of this thing. Okay? Now, let's do be the other term, the term which is on the right hand side of the quantity. So it's the sum for n1 equal a symmetric difference b, n2 equal, uh, by the way, I use here just something which was obvious to me, but maybe I should have been more careful. When you take n1 with sources a and n2 with sources b, n1 plus n2 has sources a symmetric difference with b. Something is weird here, product of x, y, and b uh, uh, on all edges. Oh, okay, I, I did correct that, yes. Thank you for noticing. Okay, so here when I do the same thing, for the second term, and I redo the, the difference I mean, the, the change of variable, I end up with F of M, W of M, indicator that M hat belongs to FB. And I end up this time with a number of N included in M, such that, well, this time the set are, there are no sources. Why? Because I started with no sources before I was starting with sources B. So N2 had sources B before, now N2 has no sources. So what do I need to prove overall? I need to prove that it's always true for any M, it's always true that this thing is equal to this thing. Right? If I can prove that for any M this is true, then I will have my identity, okay? So I want to prove that the number, I mean, I want to prove that the two following sets, okay, well, I want to prove that, sorry. So now there are two cases, or maybe let me write it in the next uh, slide. So I want to prove that 
the number of n included in m such that this is b is equal to indicator that m or let's say m belongs to fb number of n included in m so that this is empty set okay okay so case one assume that m doesn't belong in fb so here when i mean in fb uh, i i mean that the clusters of m or the connected components of m do not intersect an even number of times the guys in b or if you prefer as trish was suggesting that there does not exist a subset of m a subgraph of m with sources b okay if this is true if m doesn't belong to fb it's easy to see that then there does not exists any n included in m such that this is b either by definition if you took trish definition the yellow one or by just noticing the equivalence if you took this definition my definition so in this case zero is equal to zero okay now case two is where the small uh, mathematical delicatess comes in, which is assumed that M belongs to FB. Then there exists at least N included, uh, I'm going to call it K. There exists K included in M such that K is equal to B. Again, this is by definition, if you take Trish, not, uh, I mean the yellow event, or it's by the equivalence if you take the orange definition. Okay? So there is K. But if K exists, notice that there is a natural map between this guy and this guy. What is this map? It's simply you take N and you look at N symmetric difference with K. Okay, you take the sub, I mean, K is a subgraph of M. N is a subgraph of M. You can take the symmetric difference of the two. And the observation is that if N started with sources at B, when you do the symmetric difference with K, you end up with no sources. And it's an involution. If you reapply the symmetric difference, you end up again on the event of, uh, on, on the, the, the first set. So if it's an evolution, it's a bijection. If it's a bijection, the two sets have the same cardinality. So yota like that, yota is a bijection. And therefore, both sets have the same cardinality. And that's the end of the proof. It's a very nice, I think, combinatorial proof. There's something very beautiful using this representation, in, I mean, this equivalence in terms of multisets, and then having just this combinatorial, uh, I, I mean, mapping between the first set and the second set. Okay? Okay, so it's good because we still have uh, some time to look at yet other applications of the switching lemma. So other application, I mean, back to MPE. Do you have um, questions on this proof maybe? I should, yeah, I should first ask this. Are there questions on the proof? It looks a little bit like a magical proof, but uh, I mean, maybe it's not the most intuitive one. Um, Ever, but it's a, it's a fairly short proof, and it has a lot of applications. Ugo, yes, uh, you have a typo in case two. I mean, when this e is in, in is included in the in the event f of b f sub b, right? Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Thank you very much, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes. 
can you comment on infinite graph? Okay, so a little bit, I mean, there, when you look at currents, you need to be extremely careful on what you are doing in infinite graphs. Um, so the best thing we came up with with Michael is systematically to stay in finite graph and then take the limit. Because it can vary, it can vary quite a lot. In particular, you see, as soon as you look at currents in infinite volume, you have this problem that it's not necessarily made of loops. It can be made of arcs, of infinite paths. Right? Look at a sourceless current. The sourceless current in infinite volume may have uh, infinite paths. And then things start to be uh, messier. So I would recommend to stay in finite volume as much as possible. That's, that's what I would recommend with currents. Yeah. Okay, other questions on the proof? If not, let me give you some applications, some other applications. So a third application of, maybe it's fourth, let me check. It's a fourth application. So fourth application, it's Simon inequality. So what does this inequality say? It says the following, imagine you take a set S that contains the origin and you take X, which is not in S. Okay, so fix S containing the origin and X not in S. Then I claim that sigma zero sigma X G beta is smaller or equal to the sum of a Y on the boundary of S of sigma zero sigma Y G beta sigma zero, I mean, sigma y, sigma x, g beta. I claim that. This is a very, very useful inequality um, as I will illustrate later. So let's try to understand this, okay? So proof of this inequality. By the way, this, these applications, I will use only a small number of them tomorrow, but I really think that this deserves a class anyway. It's very good for culture. So how will we do that? So the left hand side, I mean the, the right hand side, let, let's write it like that. Let's write it to one is smaller or equal to the sum for y belonging to s of sigma zero sigma y g beta, sigma y sigma x g beta divided by sigma zero sigma x g beta. Okay, let's write it like that. And now let's apply application. It was maybe three. This is what? This is the probability if I put sources zero and x an empty set for the second current, it's probability that y is connected to x in n1 plus n2 hat. This is exactly this thing. In this case, when you take a which is 0x, uh, 0y, and b which is yx. Okay? So it's this trivial application, if you want, of the thing. Now, why is this true? Why is this inequality true? Remember that we are looking here at two currents, but the first current has sources zero and x. So if there are sources zero and x, then there must be necessarily a path from zero to x. If there is a path from zero to x, there must be somewhere a point on the boundary of s, which is connected to zero. So here, this is the expected number of points connected to zero on the boundary, but this is larger or equal to one, which is exactly half thing. So this is expectation zero x empty set g beta of the number of y connected to x uh, to zero um, where y is on the boundary. And my claim is that this is larger or equal to one since you have sources zero x. Okay, and that's the end of the proof. 
Simon inequality in uh, three lines, basically. Okay, so I really think it's a beautiful uh, game to try to recover all the 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 um, correlation inequalities of easing using random currents, and you can play with many many of them. By the way, to make you play with that, let me give you an exercise. The exercise is the following. First question of the exercise, how does the switching lemma extend when N1 is on a graph G and N2 on a graph H, which is a subset of G? Okay, I recommend to try to look at that. So here, when we stated the switching lemma, we stated it here, N1 and N2 were both currents on G. I didn't really tell it, but from the context, it was clear that we were only considering pairs of currents in G. But now imagine that you are summing the first current is on G, but the second current is on a smaller graph, H. Can you switch the, uh, the sources? The answer is yes. And the only thing that you will have to use is that here you want this to be in H. You want the event to occur when you restrict your attention to H. So if you want, you want this. When you restrict to H. That's the only change. And I let you think about it, okay? So I'm going to erase what I just did, just not to make the, not to make the, the slides completely confused. But I let you think about it as an exercise that you are allowed to switch the sources when the second current is defined on a smaller graph. And it's just, it changes the condition. The condition is that your event FB must occur when you only look at the current on the small graph. Now, application of that, lib inequality, and lib inequality is the same as before, except that there is a, a, a subtle difference, is that here, you are allowed to put correlations in S. And that changes completely the deal. This is, I mean, Simon inequality is a very nice inequality, but this Simon Lieb inequality is really extremely powerful. This one is like super, super useful. And in particular, here, there is a clear link to chi of beta c equal plus infinity. So uh, remember there was an exercise on the first day where I asked you to prove that the susceptibility was infinite at beta c. Well, this is a fairly easy exercise once you have lib inequality. So I told you do not try the exercise if you never heard about the easing model, because if you never heard about the easing model, you couldn't know about the Simon lib inequality. And without the Simon lib inequality, it's a very difficult uh, question. But with it, it's a fairly simple question. Okay? So this is a very good exercise. By the way, this Simon Lieb inequality, you can really think of it as an analog for the easing model of a trivial inequality for, uh, for random walks. The green function between zero and x is always smaller or equal to what? It's smaller or equal to the sum for y on the boundary of the probability that the random walk exit at y s for the first time, and then times the green function from y to x. So this, this is kind of the Simon Lim inequality is, a, is an analog of this inequality for the green function. Okay, that was application four. Let me give you application five which is called the Gaussian domination. Or sometimes it's referred to as Leibovitz. 
inequality. Okay, what does Lebovitz inequality say? It says the following. Defined the, I mean, okay, it says that sigma x1, sigma x4 is smaller or equal always than the sum of a pairings of sigma x pi one, sigma x pi two, sigma x pi three, sigma x pi four. You remember the whole goal of the lectures will be to basically prove that it's approximately equal. But what I'm saying is that it's always smaller or equal to the Gaussian bar. Always. Okay? Okay, let's prove it. So let's define U4, which is sigma x1, sigma x4, minus the sum of the pairings. Okay. It's a standard notation. By the way, it's called Herschel. This is called Herschel four point function. Okay. So let's define this difference and let's try to write it with random currents. Okay. So I'm going to write it like that. And here, so if I take, or maybe let me first take, if I take sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, remember that by application three again, this is sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, times the probability when I have two currents, one with sources x1, x2, x3, x4, and one with no sources. By the way, here I'm counting the xi are all distinct, okay? Let's simplify our life. So it's the probability that x3 is connected to x4, right? Simply you switch the sources, it's, it's again the same, the same condition again. You look at this with a equal x1, x2, and b equal x3, x4. So you get sigma x1, x2, x3, x4, and then you get the probability that since b is just x3, x4, is the probability that x3 is connected to x4, okay? Or maybe it's even uh, simpler if we always, uh, we can also here write maybe x1 connected to x2. Maybe this is better. And again, you may tell me, oh, but I mean, why don't you write X3 connected to X4? It's exactly back to the comment of Andris that if X1 is connected to X2, it's equivalent to X3 connected to X4 when I have these sources. It's the same set. It's the same event. Okay? I can do the same for the two other products, right? And I'm going to end up with probability same way, except that in this second guy, I'm going to have x1 connected to x3 and the other one x1 connected to x4, right? When you switch the sources, the events are going to be different. But now, when I go back to u4, I end up with sigma x1, sigma x4, expectation for the measure x1, x2, x3, x4 empty set of, well, one for the first guy. This guy is gonna give me one. The second, the first product is gonna be indicator function of X1 connected to X2. The second indicator of X1 connected to X3. And the third indicator of X1 connected to X4. Can you believe that? I mean, maybe you think, okay, I'm going a little bit fast, but I, I believe that you can trust me that if you sit and go the, through the thing slowly, you are going to end up at the same place. Okay? There I'm not hiding something very big under the carpet. 
But now this whole thing, which is inside here, it's equal to what? Well, there are two possibilities. Either x1 is actually connected to x3, x2, and x4, to all the, to the three guys. In this, case, in this case, this whole uh, quantity is minus two, right? It's one minus one minus one, one minus one. So it's minus two. If it's connected to only one of the guys, then I end up with zero, okay? And because I have sources, I know that X1 is either connected to one guy or to three guys, but it cannot be connected to only two. It would be contradictory with the set of sources. So this whole thing is simply minus two indicator function that X1 up to X4 are all connected. So overall, I end up with u4 of x1, x4 equal minus two sigma x1, sigma x4 times the probability x1, x2, x3, x4 of x1 up to x4 all connected. In particular, this is always negative. Okay? In the second and third inequalities that are analogous to the first one, should the order of indices also be changed on the left-hand side? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, so I'm not sure I got the, may, maybe let me write them like that. So this is another term and this is gonna be equal to that. And the third guy is this guy. So here you see, to switch the sources, you need to switch these guys. So you end up X1, X1 connected to X3. Uh, and here you need to switch this guy. Oh, what did I do? Sorry. And you end up with this guy. Does it answer uh, your question, Andrash? Okay, good. Seems to be answering. By the way, to bounce again on uh, the comment of Andris and to make it maybe even more natural, Notice that this is also minus two sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, probability x1, x2, x3, x4 of x1 up to x4 all connected. It's exactly the same quantity by switching lemma. So here I like it because you see it's telling you the following. In this, so here notice this is a comma. In this measure, I have two currents. I have two currents. One, the first current has sources X1 and X2. So in particular, if it has sources X1 and X2, it has at least one pass from X1 to X2. And there is a cluster, the cluster of X1 is the same as X2. It's the same cluster. So you have kind of a cluster like that. You have a cluster like that. And you are kind of asking that these clusters, they connect, but notice that they are allowed to connect through a sequence of, uh, of clusters alternating between N1 and N2, because they need to be connected in N1 plus N2. But roughly speaking, you can think of it as kind of an intersection probability of the two clusters, roughly speaking. And this is gonna be at the core of our argument tomorrow we are gonna interpret these clusters as random walks in some sense. And we are gonna look at probability of intersections in comparison to probability of intersections for random walks, okay? But as for now, today, I just want to be using the trivial fact that it is smaller or equal to zero, okay? I have 10 more minutes and I'm thinking about giving you one last not application, but uh, a glimpse at the proof that in 2D you are non-trivial, okay? So let me just try to recover where I put that because otherwise I'm gonna be here. So proposition, and this is uh, uh, the candy, on, I mean the cherry on top of, the, of today's cake, I mean, 
maybe it was not a very nice cake, but I mean, it's, um, uh, at least it's a cherry on top of that. Uh, so I think it's something like 2.3 proof of non Gaussianity in 2D easing model. Okay. And uh, to prove non Gaussianity, we are going to prove that if you take, let's say, t, t f l of sigma, and you look at the fourth moment of this random variable, okay? So uh, you remember that there was a notation t f l or maybe even t f l beta of sigma, but whatever. So this notation, I'm going to prove that even on any graph G, when G is planar, is a subset of Z2, this is smaller or equal to twice T F L beta of sigma squared squared. And that tells you it's non-Gaussian because for a Gaussian process, you will get a three here, right? The fourth moment is, is equal to three times the second moment. So if I have a uniform bond by two, that means I'm non-Gaussian, okay? And here I recommend, I'm, I'm, I'm um, letting you check that this is implied by the following observ observation that u4 of x1 up to x4 is smaller or equal to sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4. If you have this, so you remember just before I prove it's negative, u4, right? So here I was getting u4 negative, which was telling me that this is smaller than this. That's a big sum. Here I'm telling you better than negative. I'm telling you, in fact, in 2D, it's smaller than this quantity. And this quantity, if you resum everything, you see this quantity is kind of canceling one of the three pairings. So you only end up with two pairings. And when you resum, these two pairings, you get twice the second moment squared. I mean the, yeah, I, I meant this, sorry. Uh, no, 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 what do I mean? No, no, uh, ah, I mean, yeah, there is a minus that, uh, that got lost, so. A minus, yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, Peter, uh, about that. Okay, so this minus the product is canceling one of the sum of the pairings, and when you read some things, you end up with fourth moment is controlled by twice second moment squared, okay? at least for F positive. So maybe we should take F positive. Okay, so how do you prove of, you prove this inequality? By the way, if you are lost in this proof, that's not a big deal. We are not gonna reuse it tomorrow, okay? So what we claim is that one is larger or equal to the probability I'm going to take one current with sources x1, x2. So the probability that all paths in, uh, I mean, from, from x1 to x3 are, so, okay, sorry, sorry about that. I'm, I'm going, uh, I'm, I should make a drawing. So I, ha I have four points. that I put like that, okay? They are kind of, they are on the axis and here I have distance N for all the distance, okay? So they are on a, on a, a, a rotated square, okay? They are, there is symmetry in my problem. And here I'm gonna say, well, one, if I look at the measure with X1 and X2, the probability that all pass from X1 to X2 are homotopic to x1, x3, to the segment, uh, x1, x2, sorry, in uh, C minus x3, x4. So I look at the punctured plane where I remove x3 and x4. I look at the homotopy classes and I'm saying, if I'm looking at the event that all paths 
from X1 to X2 are homotopic to the segment, simply to this segment, okay? And the second event is, I'm saying, no pass is homotopic to blah, blah, okay? These are two events, they are obviously disjoint, so the sum of the two probabilities is smaller or equal to one, okay? Up to now, I didn't say anything subtle. So this is, let's say, probability P1, and this is P2, okay? So P1 plus P2 is smaller or equal to one. Okay, but now the probability for X1, X2, X3, X4, that X1 up to X4 are not all connected, I claim that for that to occur, I need either to have something that looks like that or to have something that looks like that. What do I mean by these drawings? I mean that in the first current, all paths are homotopic. To, uh, in, so let's say in the first current, all paths are homotopic to the segment. And in the second current, no path is homotopic to the rotated segment. Or the opposite. Maybe in the first current, all paths are not homotopic to the segment. And in the second current, all paths are, are homotopic. Why? Because if there exists in the first and in the second, two paths that are homotopic to the segments, then they necessarily intersect. And on the other hand, if in none of the no pass in the first current and no pass in the second are homotopic to the segments, then they, they, I mean, the paths must intersect. Okay? So this is telling me that for the path not to, not to intersect, either in the first event, in the first current, I need an event of probability P1, and in the second, an event of probability P2 because there is symmetry in the system, or in the first current, I need an event of probability P2, and the second one, an event of probability P1. This is a little bit messy, I realize it, but this is the type of thing that you better take a look yourself. So re-digest the proof later on. But the important thing that I want to mention is that this probability of not intersecting is smaller than twice P1, P2. But if P1 plus P2 is smaller or equal to one, twice P1, P2 is smaller or equal to one half. So this is smaller or equal to one half. So the probability of intersection is smaller or equal to one half. So if I go back to this formula here, I get a two, oh, sorry, I get a two, which multiply with a probability which is, uh, which is larger or equal to, uh, to one half. So I get minus one times the two, okay? So I'm gonna re rewrite it here properly. So if I'm here, I end up with U4, smaller or equal to minus two sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, times the probability x1, x2, x3, x4 of x1 up to x4, all connected. But I just told you this is larger or equal to one half. So this times this is larger or equal to one. And that's the end. So it's a very cute, topological argument based on homotopy uh, theory. So I let you think about this thing. So here I should have said, uh, this is kind of, uh, I mean, if this was event E1 and event E2, maybe this was like N1 belongs to E1 and N2 belongs to rotated version of E2. And here it was N1 belongs to E2 and N2 belongs to rotated version of E1. Okay, sorry, I missed the notion of homotopy you are using here, could be possible. It's R2 minus the two, uh, the two um, points X1 and X3, uh, X3 and X4. So you look at R minus two points, okay? 
and you look at homotopy classes and you are so you are in r minus these two points and you look at the homotopy classes of the path from x1 to x2 and you want it to be either you want all of them to be homotopic to the to the line to the segment or none of them of course it could be that some of them are and some of them aren't but we are not even going to use this we are just going to use these two events okay so this is the end of the proof of non gaussianity in 2d so tomorrow we are going to go back to this representation here of u4 to prove that in fact in dimension four this um, first we do it in dimension five and more but then we will go back to dimension four that the probability that x1 up to x4 are all connected is in fact small in large dimensions it's difficult to have a connection and that is going to be the core of the proof of triviality we are going to interpret the triviality as a non-intersection probability okay and uh, well if you are uh, courageous enough i will tell you more about that tomorrow at 11. Uh, i mean 11 o'clock geneva time of course um, okay thanks very much that okay was thank you very much the chart was very good so let me just unmute everyone so that we can uh, thank you bill uh, and I guess at this point, if there are any questions, now is a good time. So, so of course, today it was more of a toolbox, huh? but but on its own, it's kind of interesting. I mean, you get all these inequalities that maybe you never saw a proof of, and uh, you get them from a single mechanism in some sense. So it's, it's very nice. Okay, so, if there are no questions. No, I have then, one. Ah, you have uh, one. So uh, these correlation inequalities pass to phi four via this uh, Griffith Simon thing, right? Exactly, exactly. So on Friday, I hope to have a little bit of time to tell you how you can get phi four as limit of easing models. And mm -hmm. since everything I described today doesn't require anything on G, if you look about, if you think about it g didn't play any role basically in what we are doing so it will apply in the case of these generalized representations of i mean these general easing models that approximate in a better and better fashion the five four models and therefore if you are careful enough that your proof are dimensionless and things like that which is not that trivial but still can be done then you you end up with proof of triviality but also of this uh these inequalities for phi four yeah right but so for phi four you can um you you have improvements on the leverage inequality right by these skeleton inequalities so yes i yes, don't yes. see that there's a direct analog for easing is that true um so this skeleton uh, thing is is using the the bfs random work Mm -hmm. So then, then I guess you could get it also as you should you could lower bound the probability of intersection that we get, and uh, you uh, I mean that 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 uh, we got in the last slide, and it will also give you the same. I, I feel like easing is kind of uh, simpler on every aspect, and also remember that easing can be obtained as a limit of five four models, right? By looking b and lambda go to infinity in the right way. So, right. so any inequality that is true for generic uh, phi four will be a fortiori true for easing. But I think these are only so maybe AJ can correct me here. I don't know if they're true for all values of the coupling constant for phi four. Uh, this I'm, uh, uh, AJ, I don't know if he's here. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, I don't uh, I, I don't know what exactly you mean by skeleton by skeleton inequalities. But if it is like the like these lower and upper bounds for the for the for the generalized Ozel functions, in terms of like this uh, in skeleton type, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so if it's that, then at, then in Eitzemann's original paper, the geometric five four, he proves them also for easing. Ah, okay, thanks. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, the, okay, so the non-mathematical uh, question is a question I get uh, quite often. Uh, <laughs> that shows how important my life is. It's called penultimate. Uh, that's this, uh, this one. And uh, it's fairly, uh, fairly nice indeed. It's not at all done to, uh, to, to give talks. But I like the writing on it. I find it very responsive. It responds very quickly to the writing, and I like it. But I mean, it's not optimal uh, on certain other aspects, like uh, sorting or uh, converting to PDF. It's not absolutely optimal, but for the writing, it's the nicest, I think. So I have another math question. Um, ah, so the proof doesn't, for non Gaussianity of easing, doesn't work in 3D, right? No, 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 because you use homotopy, so we don't, we don't, I mean, yeah. But I, I guess, I mean, I know how to prove non-Gaussianity of 5.4 in 3D using these uh, skeleton inequalities. So how would you do it in, in 3D without these? I mean. Um, okay, maybe you, you, I mean, this I was not aware that you can prove non-triviality in 3D for 5.4. Uh, for, uh, Maybe in the continuum, but uh, even for the lattice five four. Uh, oh, you need small coupling. Ah, agent. okay, okay, okay. Well, this I, I mean, I, I'll pay for, for easing. I mean, I can tell you what is missing in some sense for easing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that much, but uh, but we don't know yet how to do. Okay, I didn't know. Uh, thank you very much for the connection for for the for the literature. I didn't know about that. So I'm going to take a closer look at it and tell you whether it, uh, it, uh, it extends. OK, thanks. One, one very mundane question. It's just on this, um, this proof of Simon Leaf by uh, like switching on, this, on, on a smaller set. Yeah. Uh, who came up with this? Uh, we discussed it with Vincent Tassion. Okay, I don't so know it's, whether it's, so it's original. So. Well, well it's, it's really, I mean, it's an exercise once you notice it. Yes, but, yes, yes. Uh, but, uh, I was just, I don't know whether it's written I, anyway. days ago, but I couldn't find a, a source for it. So. No, no, no. I, I don't think there is any source. Okay. Yeah. In general, this idea of using the switching between different uh, graphs, I mean, maybe you can see examples in a, in a, in all the papers, but it really became more uh, prominent in, uh, in our paper with Michael Eisenman and Vlada Sidoravicius to prove uh, the continuity of the phase transition. Mm -hmm. There, we really use it in a crucial fashion, and it became at least clear to me that this, this switching lemma with different graphs is a very, very useful one. So I think there was maybe a use by Fernandez and Eisenman a long time ago, but I'm not even sure. But definitely, uh, once you start playing with this, you, you end up with this improved, uh, I mean, uh, the fact that you get Simon inequality was known for a very long time. It's maybe even mentioned in the paper of Michael. But the simon Lee inequality really follows from this different graph yeah. uh, type uh, switching. Yes. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, a, very, it's, it's a very cool trick and all this, uh, um, um, Michael and, and Fernandez, they always use backbones. But you can do all these all these tricks just in with this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what Peter is referring to is that uh, there is a, a way of defining, in a kind of generic, I mean, not generic, but uh, natural fashion, a path. I mean, when we have currents with sources, then you naturally have path linking these sources, right? It's this event F B. Like if you look at a current with sources B, F B occurs automatically. Right, and this was one of the comments of Andres that then you can uh, you can rel relate different things. Um, and once you have this uh, this uh, pairings, it's natural to define kind of walks like path going from one point to I mean pairing sources. And this path they are connected to the BFS random walks, to the Bridges for the Spencer's random walks that are also valid for phi four, which are valid for spin o n in general, even though they lose properties as soon as n is not equal to one or two. So these things are called backbones in, uh, I mean, in the framework of, of, uh, 
of, of uh, random current. Uh, Michael refers to these guys as uh, backbones. And indeed, in the literature, many things were done using backbones, but at the end, uh, you can basically get rid of backbones entirely. When you have random currents, in some sense, it's kind of a more powerful uh, representation. Everything you can do with backbones, you can do with random current in a simpler fashion. Of course, there are cases where a random current kind of disappears, or at least loses the switching lemma. And when you lose the switching lemma, well, it's more convenient to work directly with these backbones. Okay. okay, so if there are no more questions, I guess that's it until uh, we resume at, at 1 p.m. Yeah. Uh, UK time. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I hope to see some of you tomorrow. Don't leave me alone. <laughs> we won't, we won't. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, so okay. I perhaps end the session and we resume, yeah, in, in an hour. By the way, I can tell you now that I thought it was at two o'clock this afternoon and uh, that uh, I realized it was at 11, just 15 minutes before the, the talk. So uh, we were very lucky that I didn't get completely humiliated uh, I see, uh, by skipping well, my own talk. So tomorrow I know it's at 11. I, uh, I checked. And <laughs> yeah, tomorrow is 11, and, but you're at uh, two your time on Friday. Yes, exactly. That's what I confused. Yeah. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.